Hello, tea friends. Yi cha hui yo. Through tea, make friends. Welcome back to our brewing tea series where we discuss all things related to tea preparation with the aims of improving your tea practice, improving our tea practice, learning and growing together. This week we're going to be talking about the five basics of all tea brewing. These form the foundation of all five preparation methods that we practice in our tradition. And I suspect that they'll be helpful for others in brewing tea in other traditions as well. Of course, I can't speak with assurance for any other brewing method, but I think that these are applicable to any method of tea brewing and will be helpful to you no matter how you brew tea. So put on a kettle, drink a few cups, drink a few bowls, and let's get started. So the first basic of all tea brewing is to divide the space in half and do everything on the right side with the right hand and everything on the left side with the left hand. This is very important for several reasons. The first and foremost is to keep us centered, keep our body, our mind and our spirit centered. When we're centered, we can let go and the tea will just flow in a harmonious and balanced way. When we're not centered, we have to use effort to balance, right? When you're perfectly balanced and standing on flat ground, you don't have to use any concentration, any effort of the mind to stay balanced. It's very easy to stay balanced. But when you're leaning on something or, or walking on a tightrope or on the edge of, the, of a building or something, then you have to use effort. You have to use mindfulness to stay balanced. And we don't want to do that. We want balance to be effortless. We want the tea to flow effortlessly. So in order to do that, we have to stay centered. It's very difficult to make tea when you're leaning like this or when you're leaning like this, you know, also you, when you go off balance, you take the whole space off balance. So those of your guests who are sitting here, will feel the, the chashi shift to this way or feel the chashi shift this way. If I do this video series like this, you can feel it. It feels awkward. If I do, if I speak like this and the whole teaching comes out this way, even just teaching, let alone tea brewing, you can feel the off balance of me being like this. When I'm centered like this, the frame is much more balanced and harmonious. And that's just for a video, let alone for, for tea brewing. Also, of course, when I turn this way, I turn my back to my guests on this side. And when I turn this way, I turn my back to my guests on this side. And that is, of course, rude. Another reason is that we want to use both hands. We want the flow and energy of both of our hands, of both of sides of our body to be working in harmony, the yin and the yang, all balanced and working and flowing in a proper way. This, of course, means that you're going to have to hand things to yourself which is fine, hand stuff to yourself. As you, as you pass it back and forth across that center line, you're gonna hand things like bowls and other things to yourself so that you can facilitate the movement from side to side. Also, practically, one of the primary reasons that tea work gets broken is people reaching across the table. Because when you reach across the table like this, the teapot now is in your blind spot. It's like that spot in your car that you can't see where the, you know, the mirror doesn't reach. And then when you come back, your sleeve or your hand can hit the teaware and pock, 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 pock. I've seen that happen a lot. That's probably the number one reason uh, for teaware getting broken that I've experienced in the few decades I've been preparing tea. I've seen that happen a lot. I've seen people reaching and then they come back and they hit something, uh, especially with the right hand because right-handed people want to reach across like this and that really puts everything in the blind spot and you can then um, break things. And uh, when you reach across like that, you can also feel how the energy shifts, feel how I've lost the teaware, so it's no longer a part of me, it's no longer in my space and in my mind, I'm not mindful of it anymore. I've lost my connection to it, my connection to it's broken uh, by going into a blind spot. And energetically, we always want to be connected to the teaware. Now, each of these five basics in more advanced versions of this teaching has an A, B, C, and D, actually. Uh, in this video, we're not going to go through all A, B, C, D, but since this isn't the first time around, for some of you, I will offer maybe a few A's uh, along the way, a little bit deeper teachings. The A for this first basic, which is to separate the, the space in half and, and do everything with the right hand and the left hand. The A is, I always teach it in a, in a kind of humorous way, is to imagine that there's a button 
on the table or on the ground right here in the center. And if that button is not depressed for let's say 15, 20 seconds, then the whole tea ceremony explodes. And we don't want everyone to explode, so we have to keep that button pressed. And that's just a humorous way of saying, keep your hands in the center. In tea, very often you're only gonna be using one hand or the other. So when you're only using one hand, the other stays centered. So I, I have this hand centered while I grab this, right? Or if I wanna do something on this side, this hand stays here in the center. Or if I'm not using either hand, then both hands are centered, right? This keeps me connected to my chashi. It keeps me connected to my teaware. It keeps me connected to the space. You can feel this when I reach off to the side to grab something. Look, if I'm going to grab like the gentry or something else that I need, if I'm turning here to grab this little lid rest here, you can see how that felt when I turned my whole body. Now, let me do it again. This time, I'm gonna keep one hand centered and I grab it like this. Now, you can hopefully feel the difference. You can hopefully feel the difference in the energy of those two. When my hand is here and I reach off to the side, it's like I stay with you, my guest. I stay connected to the space. I stay mindful of the space. I stay energetically connected to the T-Wear. The purpose of this is not to be hyper formal, to be hyper rigid. It's the opposite. The more connected I am, the more centered I am, as we already spoke about, the more I can let go, the more I can brew effortlessly, the more it can flow through me. The second basic of all tea brewing is to do with movements in tea. A lot of movements in tea are circular, right? And so all movements of the right hand go counterclockwise and all movements of the left hand go clockwise or if it helps you towards the center. This is the way our bodies are designed. This is Tai Chi, this is Qi Gong. This is the way we're designed. This doesn't work. My elbows clack, it's, there's resistance in my body. This is how my body flows, right? So this is how I would pour if I was pouring, and this is how I would pour the water from the kettle. Number three is a big one, and it's something that might be counterintuitive to some of you, and it certainly was to me. I, I spent some years uh, kind of not following this third basic, and then when I realized how important it was, it, had, it became a little bit hard to shift because I had made a habit of, of doing otherwise. So number three is to always keep the kettle in the off hand. So if you're right-handed, that means to have the kettle on the left side. And if you're left-handed, that means to have the kettle on the right side. This is really important. First and foremost, we already talked about keeping the body in balance, right? A lot of, especially right-handed people, do like 80% of things in the day with their right hand. There, there's been studies that have shown the right arm of a right-handed person is significantly stronger than the left hand because we're off balance. We're doing so, we're favoring one hand so much. It's almost like the left hand is, is just some evolutionary vestige, like the tailbone, and we don't need it. We're not using it, but it should be involved. It should be strong. And by putting the heaviest element in the left hand, you're bringing strength to the left hand. You're bringing balance to the left hand. A byproduct of tea brewing over these decades is that I have actually become ambidextrous. I can brew tea both ways now and uh, do other things that way too. I can even write a little bit with my left hand. So bringing balance to your tea brewing will also bring more balance to your day and to your, to your body. Holding the kettle in the off hand brings strength to the off hand and balance. But that's a, really a minor reason. The major reason for this is fluency. The major reason for this is, is effortless fluency, which forms the basis of all East Asian art. Uh, when, you, when you're painting with a, with a brush on rice paper, if you stop, the ink starts to bleed, right? You have to move. So there's a saying in, in Chinese, which is yi, yi qi he chang, which means literally finished in one breath. But qi is also energy, so it can mean like finished in one movement, finished in one energy. So it means, no hesitation. Hesitation is where the mind comes in. Hesitation is where the ego comes in. Hesitation is where thinking comes in. This is why we have to also get the, the, the method so ingrained in us that we can transcend it, let go of it, and things can flow effortlessly. So in order to do that, we, we use the kettle in the left hand because if the kettle's in the right hand, first of all, the the whole session's off balance because everything's happening with the right hand and it, the left hand's just doing nothing, if maybe just sitting in the center. But when we use the left hand for the kettle, 
we're much more fluid. There's much less hesitation. And this is very especially important in Gong Fu Ti, which we'll discuss in a minute. So if I have the kettle in the right hand like this, and I pour, right? And then I have to set the kettle down to pick up the pot to pour my tea, right? And what happens is the flow is like a, a broken car, stuttering. It's a stuttering motor with a, with a stop and start, stop and start hesitations, right? Whereas when I have the kettle in the offhand, you see, you can already see what's coming, right? I can pick this up at the same, in one movement. So there's fluency. And as I mentioned earlier, that fluency is especially important in Gong Fu Ti. Because in Gong Fu Ti, especially in the early steepings of some certain teas, that few seconds creates a whole different tea, right? When you're getting to the second and third steeping of a fine cliff tea, for example, where those steepings, you want them to be flash, which means immediate. That few seconds creates a totally different flavor, aroma, energy, frequency. So those few seconds will matter. So being able to pour and pick up in the same movement is, is really important and allows it to flow. It allows there to be fluency. And that fluency will become important. And in certain teas, it will become paramount because it will be the difference between one kind of tea and another kind of tea. Those few seconds do matter in the early steepings of some teas, especially when preparing tea kung fu. Now we can have an A for this one too. The A for this one is how to hold the kettle. Sometimes people want to hold the kettle like this, right? Because it's heavy, right? And this helps them to, to, to lift it up by having their hand to the back of the handle. But that's not ideal. The ideal is to have your index finger riding down the handle. And the further down you can go, the better. If most kettles, when they're big like this one, going too far down will, will make it off balance. So you got to find the sweet spot. Right? If you have a small kettle, you can go further down. If you have a bigger kettle, you got to go back a little bit. But having your index finger down gives you much more fluency in, in your circular movements and much more control over the amount of pour, the flow. So when I'm holding like this, I can control the flow a lot better and I also have much more movement. I have much more graceful movement in that circle. Whereas when I hold it like this, there's really just on and off, on and off, on and off on and off, and there's not really that much circular movement at all. So when we hold it with our index finger down, we get more movement in a circle, we get more control over the flow, and more precise pouring, right? Actually, in Gong Fu Ti, we don't even want to pour the tea, we want to place it, right? Oftentimes you can feel the connection between your hand and the kettle, but the connection doesn't end here. It actually can continue into here and, and so forth. So when you're more sensitive, having, your, uh, having control over this, over this and having this connection here, especially in Gong Fu Ti, will be very important because we don't want to pour, we want to place the tea. And uh, these kettles that we've designed actually have a ridge on the handle for your finger that make it very comfortable to, to put your, your index finger down the kettle. The fourth and fifth basics of tea brewing go internal. They're less to do with external things and more to do with internal things. But the internal, of course, motivates the external. They are connected and the external then flows back into the internal through the tea that you drink. So your mind, your energy, your focus comes out and creates the tea and you drink the tea and it goes back in. So it's like a feedback loop. And so being uh, in, in the proper orientation internally creates the tea and the tea then stimulates and helps you to be oriented properly on the inside. This is the beauty of arts like this and, uh, and of the mindfulness that comes through the practice of tea. The fourth uh, is a very important basic and, and underlies all tea preparation, no matter what kind of tea we're preparing. And that is to never ever times 10. So ever, 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 pick up this kettle until your heart is still. Everything starts when you pick up the kettle. All movement begins from there. That's the first note of the symphony, right? And so we want our tea brewing to come out of stillness. The mind is the most important element in tea preparation, more important than the tea, the water, or the teaware, or even the method, right? 
to improve your tea, you improve your mindfulness, you improve your stillness. Tea that is prepared out of stillness helps guide those who drink it towards their own stillness. It points the way. This is true of all arts, and this is the true mission of all art, which is to take us to the place of agape, which means to bring us to a standstill. Right? I can remember the first time when I was a teenager and I saw Michelangelo's Pieta, I was completely struck into agape in perfect stillness. Because the art came out of stillness, it, it, it reminds us of the stillness that's inside of us. It points us, it's a compass towards our own stillness. And so the mind that makes the tea should come out of stillness. And there is always an opportunity to relax more because you can always relax more. And so for me, I never ever, times 10 ever, allow a single steeping to go by without first calming myself. Even if I feel very calm and very centered, I still take a moment to calm down before I lift the kettle. No matter how calm and still I am, I've just made a habit, I've made a practice of doing this every steeping. And now I do it every steeping of every session of every steeping of every session of every steeping. I continue this practice and I will until I die. Now, of course, there's many ways to calm down. You could say a mantra, you could cast a spell, I, it doesn't matter to me. For me, I'm a simple man, so I just, I just breathe. I just use my breath. I just, in other words, take a pause, take a few breaths, calm down. This is a beautiful, beautiful time to pause. Actually, the time when the water was boiling was always traditionally a time for meditation. We know this because there's many poems in Chinese that say, uh, the wind soughing the pines summoned me back from my meditation. And the wind soughing the pines, of course, was the sound of the water boiling in a metal kettle. They said it sounded like the wind soughing the pines. So that became a, a poetic way of discussing the water boiling. So this line, the wind soughing the pines summoned me back from my meditation, means I was meditating and then the kettle started boiling and it was time for tea. So it's always worthwhile to calm down. It's always worthwhile to take a few breaths. I like to connect the kettle and the, and the teapot because the water and the tea have already met. They already know each other. And so now the channel's flowing through me and I can check, is the channel clear? Are there any thoughts? Is there anything in the way? Because if there's anything in the way, that tea will not be made well. I have to get out of the way. Just like an athlete, if they have something on their mind, they won't play well that day. If they've gotten in a fight with their girlfriend or whatever, then the bookies try to find that information and bet against them. You gotta be clear to play well, right? You gotta be clear to uh, make beautiful music or paint or anything. When I'm painting, if there's any of me in the painting, I crumple it up. I have to be a channel. I have to be open and free and loose and, and completely clear. Even if you feel clear, relax and then relax some more. You can always go a little deeper. You can always become a little more present. You can always take a step a little bit more into the present moment, a little bit more into stillness. Stillness is infinite and endless, so you can always take a step deeper. So it's worthwhile to make a practice every steeping, to take a step deeper into stillness before you pick up the kettle. If I pick up the kettle and then say, Larry, how you doing? Welcome to my tea. Right, nothing good is gonna come of that. That kind of talking results in broken teaware and uh, all kinds of things th that you know get disturbed. In fact, in traditional Chinese culture, this has been lost to some extent, but traditionally, it was considered rude to talk while you were preparing tea, even amongst businessmen and friends. So maybe the others continue the conversation, but the one who is preparing, while they're preparing the tea, they, they should be quiet because otherwise they, they believe the words would get in the tea. And, uh, you know, which in essence they do. That kind of mind then gets in the tea. So when, we, when we're the one preparing, we should focus. We have to put our heart into the tea. And so we, should, we have to stay focused on it. And so even in a session where there's conversation, even in a session that's casual, which is a huge part of tea, if you're just drinking tea ceremonially, upright, formal, you're missing out on half of what tea is. Because tea is also civilization, it's kindness, it's friendship. It's a beautiful time to relax and, and have a good time with friends and talk and chat. But if you're only doing that, you're also missing out on half of what tea is because tea is also ceremonial and meditative and has been for thousands of years. So we should have both of these and be open to both of them. But in a session that's conversational, if I'm the one preparing, I'm always quiet while I'm preparing the tea. Right? And I honor my guests in that way by making really nice tea for them. And that way also our conversation has pauses. 
and pauses in conversation are great. When you have pauses in conversation, you as the host can change the subject, for example, if the subject of the conversation has gone somewhere that is not healthy for a tea ceremony, like, you know, whatever, religion, politics, things that are going to make people argue. We don't want them to argue. So we can, in those pauses, as we're preparing the tea, we can then change the subject. There's a beautiful subject that we can always change to, which I always recommend, which is always change the subject to tea. Bring the conversation back to the tea itself. The beautiful thing of changing the topic back to the tea is that the tea is always present. The tea is always awake. The tea is always enlightened because it doesn't have a mind full of cloudy, deluded, twisted thoughts or greed or anything. It's just pure and free. And so it's always present in the present moment, right? And it has no mind in it. So by bringing the topic back to the tea, you always bring the topic back to the present moment, which is beautiful in a tea ceremony in which there's conversation. You could, of course, change the topic to anything you like, but for me, I always return, try to bring the conversation back to the tea when I feel like it's straying somewhere that it shouldn't. Of course, good conversation should be loose and relaxed, not formal, but you know, if I feel like we're going somewhere controversial, I can change the subject. Also, those pauses allow people to listen more, and conversations are much more healthy and, and nourishing when there's an equal amount of listening and talking. So having those pauses allows me to listen more and practice listening more. So it's always worthwhile for me and I always, always, always take the time, right? And that's why there's 10 evers. Never ever times 10. Pick up the kettle until your mind is still. Now, of course, this, keep this within reason. Don't sit there for hours and your guest asks you, hey, where's the tea? And you're like, well, my teacher said I can't pick up the kettle until my mind is still and I'm having a rough day, so no tea today. Nonsense. The point of this is just the never ever times 10 is just a strong emphasis on doing this every steeping, doing, getting, making the habit of doing it every time. And doing it every time means just taking a moment, take, doing some breaths, mantra, whatever, whatever calms you down, whatever stills you, whatever centers you. It's always worth the effort to take a step deeper into stillness every single steeping. The fifth and final basic of all tea brewing comes out of the fourth. There's no point in stilling my mind. There's no point in taking steps deeper into stillness before I pick up the kettle, which starts the movement. There's no point in starting the movement from stillness and then breaking that stillness. So if I calm down, center myself, and I'm very still, and then I pick up the kettle, and I come to here, and then I say, Larry, and then I just lose all that stillness that I cultivated. So the fifth basic of all tea brewing is stay with the tea. Stay with the tea. Stay with the tea means all of your samadhi, all of your one-pointedness of mind, all of your mindfulness, all of your concentration, not the type of concentration that is flexed, not this kind of concentration, like a student in school furrowing their brows and straining really hard, not that kind of concentration, a relaxed, loose kind of concentration, the same kind of concentration we cultivate in meditation. It's upright, but it's calm, but it's loose. It's upright, but it's relaxed. It's upright but it's free, right? But you want to stay with the tea. With all of your being, stay with the tea. When I pick, I've, I've stilled myself, I've stilled my mind, and now I've picked up the kettle, and I'm going to stay with the tea. I'm going to stay with the tea. Of course, I'm giving you a dialogue, but that's just for learning purposes. I'm going to stay with the tea, stay with the tea. All of my concentration, all of my focus is here with the tea. All of it still here, still in this space really focused, really concentrated, but loose and free. And then I'm gonna hand the bowl to my guests. At this time, I can then break the concentration. But until you hand the tea off, you should stay with the tea. So for the basic number four and basic number five go together. Basic number four reminds us that between every steeping, it's always worth taking a step deeper into stillness. No matter how relaxed you are, relax more. Take a few breaths, calm down, connect the, tea, the teapot and the kettle, make sure the channel is clear, and then pick up the pot and stay with the tea. As always, I'm going to give you some homework for each one of these videos. In this episode, of course, your homework is to work with these five basics. Work with one in particular or work with all five. Experiment with them. 
You have to understand these things, not just because I said or because there's some formal rule, but you have to understand it in application, experientially, for yourself. So try holding the kettle in the, in the strong hand and in the off hand and see what the difference is. Hold it properly and hold it any other way and see if you actually do have more circular control, if you do have more control over the pour. Try centering yourself in between each steeping every session. If you haven't done that up until now, try staying with the tea. See what those two things do to your tea practice. Do they help improve your, your, the quality of your tea? The flavor, the aroma, on a physical level, does it change? If it does, that's magnificent. Does it change on an energetic level? How does it change when you stay focused, when you stay with the tea, when you center yourself before each steeping? See what impact these five basics have on your tea practice and learn for yourself why they're important by breaking the rules, by understanding both of the sides of it, by experimenting and practicing. And then of course, make some comments below. Tell us which one of the five basics you didn't know about before, which one you need to work on, which one you understand, which one makes sense to you, which one doesn't make sense. Ask any questions. We promise to answer all of your questions in the comments below this video. So let us know what your work with this, these five basics is and how it's going and what your experiment is, how you set it up, which one of them you wanna work with more, which one of them you, you don't yet understand or any other questions that you have about the five basics, put it below and we'll have a beautiful discussion and then we can learn and grow together. If you like this video and you wanna support us, we can make more videos like this, please go to globalteahut.org and subscribe to our magazine. You get a 60 page ad free magazine every month filled with tea wisdom, everything from science and biology and tea processing and history and ethnography and tea wear and tea brewing, everything tea related every month. And it of course comes with a beautiful environmentally friendly chemical free tea every month so you can also drink tea with people all around the world, a growing beautiful community in more than 60 countries and we have an app for, so you can connect to each other and learn and grow and host tea gatherings or visit other people's tea gatherings. Of course, all the proceeds then support our free tea center here in Taiwan where we host two 10 day courses every month and people come from all over the world to, to learn about tea and immerse themselves in a life of tea for 10 days so that they can go home and have a more established practice, start their practice or deepen their practice. And these courses are free because of Global Tea Hut and because of your support. So if you haven't yet subscribed, please go and subscribe. And if you already have subscribed, please help us share the word Please help us spread the value of this message, spread it so we can continue to create beautiful free content like these videos, like our podcast, like the magazine, all the things that we're doing in service of tea and in service of you and in service of ourselves. If you help us spread the word and Global Tea Hut subscription increases and grows, not only does it support our free center now, but it helps us to facilitate the dream of building a future bigger tea center because our courses right now often fill up very quickly and there's huge waiting lists of 20 to 30 people to get into courses. And so we obviously need a bigger center so that we can host bigger, larger courses and facilitate more people in their tea growth and tea practice. Until next time, practice these five basics of tea, learn and grow and be better. And of course, also enjoy some beautiful tea. The best way to fulfill a pot of tea and bring it to its highest potential is Gong Fu Tea. Join us next time on Brewing Tea as we start exploring this marvelous brewing technique, Gong Fu Tea.